Hi class, let's consider our, continue our discussion on human evolution. From your table, ta textbook table 23.1, we can see that there have been, within the fossil record, organisms that resemble current modern human beings. And these organisms started out a long time ago not resembling current modern human beings at all. So if we look approximately two billion years ago, we find that the modern domain of eukarya first established itself within the fossil record. And after that, we find that we have animals, then we have spinal cords, and then we have mammals, then we have primates. And from two billion years ago to 60 million years ago, we have the appearance of a primate, then we have the hominidae appear, and then genus Homo within that family appear, and then approximately 100,000 years ago, the species Homo sapiens, we, as humans, appear within the fossil record. So if we look at these domains of life that we're broken up into, we have bacterial domains, archaeal domains, and then eukaryotic domains. And within that eukaryotic domain, we have animals or human beings. One of the things that I always get a kick out of this figure is, is that we as human beings have more in common with fungi than we do with bacteria. Now, if we look at the primates, and we as human beings are categorized as a primate, a key characteristic of a primate is that it has an opposable thumb, and that opposable thumb has a saddle joint or within, it, within, the, the, um, within the hand, and allows for much more grasping and gripping than would otherwise be possible. We also have stereoscopic vision. This essentially means that we have two eyeballs that are pointing the same direction. And since those two eyeballs are slightly offset from each other, they are able to determine how far away an object is. We also typically, as primates, will have well-developed brains. These well-developed brains prim primarily are going to have an overdeveloped cerebrum. We are also going to have a reduced number of offspring. As primates, we take a, um, an approach where we invest a lot of biological resources into a few offsprings, as opposed to investing hardly any biological resources in an individual offspring. But since we produce hundreds or thousands of them, one of them is bound to survive. And then we also typically are going to have an emphasis on learned or social behavior as primates. Within the group of primates, there are two suborders. Those are the prosimians and the anthropoids. Prosimians are going to be less like us as human beings. They'll include lemurs, tarsiers, and lorises. This group, um, we're not going to focus that much on because, let's face it, as a human being, we're more interested in human beings. So we're going to spend more time focusing on the anthropoids, which includes us as human beings. Within the prosoids, we can look at the different kinds of apes that are uh, around. These apes are going to have opposable thumbs, eyes on the front of their head. They are going to have well-developed cerebrums, and if we notice here, few numbers of young, only one young per mother, and learned social behaviors. These are social organisms. When we compare a human skeleton to a chimpanzee skeleton, we can start to see that there's some very specific adaptations that we have that allow us to stand upright. For instance, we have our spinal column exiting the bottom of our skull as opposed to the posterior of the skull. Our spinal column as a human being also is going to be curved with an S shape as opposed to a C shape. And this S shape curvature of our spinal column allows it for us to more easily stand upright. And because we spend more time standing upright, we need to keep our legs directed underneath our body so that the force is more evenly distributed through our legs as opposed to organisms that don't spend a lot of time walking upright. The force of their, through their legs is distributed more laterally which is less efficient and allows for a slower gait when on two feet, or a slower bipedal gait. So, guys, gals, which of the following features allow for humans to stand upright? We have an S curvature of the spine, spine exiting at the bottom of the call, vertical angling to the knees, and arching on the foot, or E, all the above. Go ahead and take some time to get me an answer. Pause the video or rewind if you need to. Five. 
four, three, two, one. The correct answer is E, all of the above. On this last slide, I forgot to emphasize the fact that we as humans also have arched feet. This arching of our feet allows for more efficient shock absorbing by our feet compared to many chimpanzees and other apes which have, are flat-footed and has, have less shock absorbing capabilities within their feet. <coughs> now when we look at primates, these primates, of which we humans are one, are going to have some hypothetical common ancestor. And this hypothetical common ancestor has differentiated each one of these differentiation points is going to be the introduction of a new characteristic or a trait. And at the top of the totem pole, we as humans are very egocentric. We put ourselves at the top of the totem pole. We believe we are the most highly evolved of the apes. But as we go from the bottom of this family tree to the top of the family tree, we have simpler organisms that are capable of fewer cognitive skills, and we progress in complexity as we head up, 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 and up, till eventually get to human beings. Hominins are a genus, or excuse me, is a, is a group that includes the genus Homo and other close relatives. So we back up a slide here. The hominins include gorillas, chimpanzees, humans, but they don't necessarily include rhesus monkeys or lemurs or tarsiers. Some very key characteristics of hominins, and I need to emphasize hominins is an umbrella term that includes homo genus as a subcategory. Some characteristics of all hominins is that they are bipedal, they have flat face with pronounced chins, and they have relatively large brain sizes. So the brain size has increased. Now the first hominins appear within the fossil record somewhere between six and seven million years ago, depending on how accurate the radiometric dating is at the time. We have found um, Central African fossils seven million years ago, and we found East African fossils 5.8 to 5.2 million years ago. Some of these fossils include the, I'll be honest, I cannot pronounce these scientific names. So bear with me while I butcher this name. Sahelanthropus tichandensis, or we have Oroin tugensis, or Ardipicus kadaba. <laughs> Can you tell that I don't spend a lot of time pronouncing early hominin scientific names? <laughs> Anyways, these hominins have split from the line of apes within the fossil record approximately seven million years ago. I need to emphasize that they're found in Africa, found in Africa, found in Africa. There's another group of hominins that is found in the fossil record, and this was also in Africa, and it appeared approximately three million years ago. This group is known as the Australopithecines, and these hominins had slight frames, so they didn't necessarily have as stout or robust of skeletal structure. Their slight frames, though, still had very large jaws, and these large jaws were used so that they could still feed on plant materials. They were found, based on their fossil record, to walk upright. They had long limbs, particularly long forelimbs, that are, uh, and they had smaller brains. Then we had the Australopithecines. This is also known as, quote unquote, Lucy. Australopithecines africanus is a was found to have a large brain and was um, initially thought to be the, quote unquote, missing link in human evolution. It was a very popular candidate for the ev creation or the evolution of the Homo genus. Here is a recreation of Australopithecus africanus, aka Lucy. We have found fossilized footprints from these organisms, in addition to skeletal remains that have been fossilized. So, guys, gals, concept check. Which of the following is not a defining characteristic of hominids? Bipedal, opposable thumbs, flatter face with more pronounced chin, 
or increased brain size. Go ahead and rewind this video. Pause it, check your checks, check your notes. Get me an answer. Five, four, three, two, one. Opposable thumbs is not a defining characteristic of hominins. Opposable thumbs are present in other groups of ape-like creatures that are not hominins. Hominins specifically are defined by their bipedal locomotion, a flat face, and an increased brain size. Moving on, let's talk about the genus Homo within the group hominins. The Homo genus is defined by having a big brain of 0.6 liters or 600 cubic cc, cubic centimeters or larger. There's also going to be evidence of tool use, and this tool use is going to go hand in hand with the increased brain size. And then finally, the jaw and teeth of the Homo genus resembles human beings. Early um, representatives of the Homo genus include Homo habilis and Homo erectus. And then there are other subspecies or species within the Homo genus that were found later on. These include the Homo neanderthal and the Cro-Magnons. So within this group, this genus, we don't have the first Homos until relatively recently in the fossil record. So these first Homos appeared two million years ago with Homo habilis, then we have Homo egaster, Homo erectus, and Homo neanderthalus, and Homo sapiens. We, as human beings, have categorized ourselves as Homo sapiens because we, were sa we are sapient or have sapient self-awareness. So let's talk about Homo habilis. Homo habilis was found to live approximately two-ish million years ago, and Homo habilis had an enlarged brain, particularly with the part of the, when we looked at the part of the brain associated with speech. Homo habilis is hypothesized to be omnivorous, because of the presence of both molars and canines. And based on the brain size, it was also believed to be both a hunter and a gatherer. Primitive tools have been found at the fossil dig sites for Homo habilis. And it's hypothesized that Homo habilis may have had culture because they had that enlarged area for speech within their cranial vault. If we look at Homo erectus, Homo erectus is the newer kid on the block compared to Homo habilis. Homo erectus died out approximately 300,000 years ago. Homo habilis had an increased cranial vault size or larger brain size. Homo habilis also is associated with having a flatter face and stood tall and erect with a striding gait based on the fossil record. It's hypothesized that Homo hap erectus left Africa and went to Europe and to Asia. Homo erectus has more advanced tools associated with its fossil sites, and this goes hand in hand with its increased cranial size. These advanced tools and the use of fire are going to be associated with this organism. It's believed that this is uh, Homo hab erectus was a systematic hunter, and that Homo habilis has also had language capabilities. These language capabilities of Homo erectus go hand in hand with its increased cranial vault size. When we look at the fossil record of these great apes or pre-humans, we find that it's a pretty spotty fossil record. And when I say spotty, I mean that we very rarely um, are capable of reconstructing or collecting a complete skeleton. For example, here with Homo ergaster, we don't see all of the bones of the skeleton. They weren't all recovered from the fossil site. Now, if we look at modern humans, Homo sapiens, we find that, or we currently hypothesize, I should say, that Homo sapiens came out of Africa. This is known as the out of Africa hypothesis. And this hypothesis is very widely accepted right now. And the technical term for this is the replacement model. It re proposes that Homo sapiens came out of Africa, and then those Homo sapiens replaced other Homo species that had already migrated to Asia and Europe. And we find this within the fossil record in that other pre-human species were already present in these other continents, but they were wiped out approximately 100,000 years ago. So in other words, it's believed that multiple species left Africa 
multiple pre-human species left Africa, but once modern humans were on the scene, they wiped out those other pre-human species. Within the fossil record, we find that homo fossils show up in Africa between 1.9 and 2.3 million years ago. And the farther away from Africa we go, the more re recent the, the um, within the fossil record those species appear. Let's talk about Neanderthals. Neanderthals were discovered approximately, um, were discovered in Germany, and were believed to be um, present in Germany 200,000 years ago. This pre-human species is characterized by very well-developed brow lines and the nose, jaw, and teeth, so the lower mandible protrude forward, and that there's a sloping forehead and no chin present. And then there's the earliest pre-humans, or the earliest humans. Those are known as the Cro-Magnons. The Cro-Magnons lived between 40,000 and 100,000 years ago and were believed to be the earliest Homo sapiens. They had a very modern skeletal appearance and had an advanced culture that included art, tools, and assuming language. And it's also believed that these were very cooperative hunters. Why do we know this? Based off of their cave paintings that are still present in modern day Europe. Within humans, or Homo sapiens, there's going to be a lot of variation. These variations between populations are called ethnic groups or ethnicities. And these variations are adaptations to local environments. We have changes in skin color. We have changes in body structure and that some people are stocky. Other people have long, narrow limbs. For example, if we look at Bergman's rules, Bergman's rule is just a general trend that was observed within mammals that individuals that lived in cold regions had bulkier builds because they were better able to conserve heat with those bulky builds. And then individuals that lived in warmer regions had more slender builds that they were better able to cool their bodies with. And then there's Allen's rule. And this is just another trend that was noticed within modern mammals. Individuals that or organisms that live in those cold regions have short limbs and digits and ears, and then the corresponding organism in the, law, the warm region has larger limbs, digits, and ears. I remember seeing some, when I was a young and undergraduate student, comparing and contrasting the size of the ear of an Arctic hare to the ear of a desert hare. If we look at human beings in general, we can see lots of variation within the species. Uh, we can have brown skin, we can have black skin, we can have other variations of brown skin, we can have Caucasian skin, we can have dark, dark skin, and then every color in between. We have slender builds, we have stocky builds. Within human beings, there's a lot of variation. So, let's go. Concept check. Where are Homo sapiens believed to have originated? North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, or Antarctica? Go ahead and pause the video and get me an answer right meow. Five, four, three, two, one. The correct answer is D, Africa. It's the replacement or out of Africa hypothesis. And that's all we have on the Evolution of humans. If you have any questions for me about this lecture recording, please feel free to post them in the class discussion board, shoot me an email, or swing by my office when you are on campus. Happy studies!